The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Felix, I really want to play that game. I've been no, playing it all morning no, and I want to play it all, I, all day long you, until 5 o'clock. No, I'm playing Come now. On, let me play. I, let I, me I, play, Felix. Like, guys, I'm guys, playing. why are you fighting over this hex game? Can you just stop playing it or do you love it that much? There's only well, one. There's only, yes, exactly what he said. Well, you know, back in the 40s, there was only one computer in the whole world. And, and they shared. Share it. Well, I don't want to it's share. Like they had the to take turns century. figuring out artillery tables. Okay, okay, what if we did this? What if we made another one or figured out a way to make it a kit even? Then we could make all the hex games in the world. Who knows, maybe other people would even want to buy it. It is pretty fun. That'd be brilliant, then we wouldn't have to fight. Awesome idea. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Hey Felix, you know how that hex game turned out really good? Yeah, it was super duper ultra mega time. Yeah, now you were saying that uh, yourself and a friend both thought that it would be a good project for, for schools, like like a, a soldering project and a programming project. Yeah, in the uh, soldering class, mm -hmm. we uh, had a few different projects that weren't quite as interesting, but uh, when when I started messing with it, I thought, man, this would be a really great kit to put together for a, a class. And How much do you think the soldering kit that you used cost? You know, I don't know because it was part of the the uh, course. Would someone at MATC be able to tell you that? You know, I could, uh, yeah. I mean, I like could. find like what a target is? Mm -hmm. I could find I out I mean, obviously, you know, you want to make things, you know, cheap enough for schools, but then schools don't necessarily always have the cheapest stuff either. Right. What I did was I got some more parts from Element 14. What parts did you get? Well, basically most of the same stuff, mm -hmm. but a surface mount. I see. So I got a surface mount AT Tiny 25, which is a smaller version of this. So there's AT Tiny 25, 45, 85, and like a lot of the ML chips, they're identical except for the program space and RAM. And I checked the code for this, it's 2,030 bytes, which means it would fit within 2K, which is 2,048 bytes. That's good. Something else that I got were some PNP transistors. Because we had a problem when we drove the LED display. We were just using the shift registers and there wasn't enough current per pin to do it properly. Right. But if we trigger a PNP transistor with the same I.O., we should get enough current to source all uh, seven digits. Yeah, that'd be good. And I also got some of these um, LCD displays because they are a little cheaper than the digits. However, this is one common pin and then like 24, 23 IO pins. It's not matrixed. Like this one, you're, you're going like draw, 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 draw. Right. Which means you just need one, two, three selector bits and then seven plus one, eight data bits. So you can do it with 11 IO, which fits within two shift registers. But this would be something like, oh gosh, I think three shift registers, possibly even four. Basically, in order to use a cheaper display, we'd have to spend more on the I.O. chips, which is kind of, you know, catch 22. What about the LEDs? And next question, the battery. Yeah, also the speaker is something we need to think about. Like, we have a bunch of like piezos laying around, right? Probably. Yeah, I'd kind of, I think I'd like to have a piezo instead of a speaker just because it'd be a little bit more compact, and this is mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, you could affect it. Um, okay, so the LEDs, I kind of like the idea of using just these old school uh, five millimeter LEDs, because if we made them surface mount, they'd be even physically lower than they already are, and right now there's a good distance between the top of the switch and the standard LED. So I kind of like just having, you know, big fat ancient LEDs, yeah. So if we could turn these into push buttons, and turn this into a slide switch, then only require uh, eight toggle switches, because the toggle switches are more expensive. Yeah. So the fewer of those, the better. Oh, we also still need the start button. The reset button probably is unnecessary. I mean, we could probably have a pad for it, but you know, it'd be up to the user okay. whether or not they, yeah, that's whether good or they want to stuff it. And if we have a LiPo, we would need a um, charger, charging circuit in there. But uh, hmm. what about trip, uh, double A's or a different battery pack? Uh, I don't know, from, from a kit stamp, I, I kind of like the idea of batteries, just like two AAs because mm -hmm. it's simpler. Yeah, we just get a double A battery holder. We don't have to add a LiPo or a LiPo charging circuit. Uh, well, I was thinking what we could do, Felix, just to test some of these ideas is rig this thing up 
to work that way. Like pipe double A's into it, see if it still works. Uh, yeah, so let's do that. Let's um, mod this with a AT25 and then hook it up to double A's and see if it still works. And then if it does, I think we should start mapping this out and drawing it up in Eagle. I've already downloaded a lot of Eagle uh, part diagrams off of Element 14 for a lot of these things. Um, I probably won't be able to find everything, so some of them I might have to make some parts manually. Yeah, but a lot of this stuff is bog standard, like transistors yeah. and AT Tiny. It's just a, you know, SOIC 8. All right, let's get modding. Hey, you want to start seeing if there's Eagle libraries for these parts? In the project folder, there's a folder for production parts, which contain all these parts. So, yeah. I may have already downloaded some Eagle files. I think there's an Eagle folder as well. Could you just check out, check into that while I do this? Yep. All right, let's, uh, let's try this with two AAs. Well, it still turns on, but the LEDs are noticeably dimmer. You can see it here. See how the one is brighter than the sixes? That's because there's fewer digits on that driving line. Uh, you know, Felix, I don't know, two AAs is not well, super ultra mega time. Yeah. You want to see? Sure. Oh, yeah, huge difference. Yeah, and that LiPo, I mean, that LiPo's lasted a long time. Like, Max has been playing this thing all the time. We haven't recharged it yet. Hmm. Is this the one from the PlayStation? I think so, yeah. It's like a PlayStation 3 uh, controller LiPo. Two AAs, probably not quite enough. Did they make three AA battery packs? Yeah, I really? think we might have one. Let me Yeah, why don't you check. look for that, and I'm going to try swapping in the uh, AT25 chip and programming it while you do that. Okay. So, we found a <laughs> triple... Double A battery pack. So confusing. And we hooked it up and it's nice and bright. Look at that. Did we test the current on this before? I mean, we didn't really care. I that, did don't we? think so. Maybe we should do that. All right, let's see how much current it takes. Oh yeah. Uh, so the max I saw was 427 milliamps. Okay. It's actually higher than I would have guessed. Um, all right, so calculator. Okay, so if we say uh, 2,000 milliamp hours average for the AAA divided by 42.7, hours, worst case. And the average was a lot less than that. The average was 70 milliamps. So worst case, uh, four hours, best case, 28 hours. Awesome. That should be fine. All right, Felix, I did a preliminary layout in Eagle. This looks pretty nice. And I printed it so we can see we got the right packages. As everyone knows, I love printing things. Look at that. This reminds me of those people that build ships in bottles, you know? So I was thinking, Felix, to save space, we could put these chips under the digits. I wonder if we could make this a single layer board. I wonder if that's possible. That definitely seems to be the uh, compact way of doing things. I like that idea. The The downfall to that is if it was used in a classroom mm -hmm. as an evaluation kit, the instructor might have a little bit of difficulty. Uh, They'd seeing. have a lot of difficulty <laughs> seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, and something else, um, you wouldn't know if you'd soldered this correctly until you put this in place. Oh, yeah. And then if you did have to make a change, you'd have to desolder this. Maybe that's part of the idea. It's not really the best, but I mean, we could put these this way. Yeah. And move the uh, buttons in a little bit. I definitely like the idea of having it under the display, so, but. Well, I mean, of course, if it was a two sided board, then you just put them on yeah. the back side. No problem there. Well, I guess the question is uh, oh, wait, I just thought of something else. If we make a laser paint version of this, Felix, mm -hmm. you know, we can only do single sided. Well, we can do double sided, but remember how much of a pain it was Forget to light that. up? Yeah, let's just do single sided, yeah. Yeah, well, my point is if this was a single sided board, the copper pads, you'd want them to be on the bottom anyway, because we're putting our part through the top and soldering right. on the yeah. bottom. So maybe we do it single sided, but we actually reverse all these parts so they're in the back. So we could put those chips. Oh there. yeah, hey, see what I'm solution. saying? Solution, yeah, that would work. So actually, the seven segment display would be on the back. Yeah, it would be no, it would be well, soldered on the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So well, like, here's an example. Like this is what it would be like. See, one side mm -hmm. is just the holes, and the other side has copper. Right. So if you think of from that case, so we would surface mount these in the back, and they'd be you know behind the LED, but you, it wouldn't affect the pins of either. Right. You'd be able to see both of their pins, and then when you flip it around, pretty much only thing you'd have in the front would be, well, you'd have the LEDs and the switches. the switches. Everything else would be on the back. So I guess for our purposes, since we can we can make really good PCBs, but only with one-sided laser paint, mm -hmm. I guess we're just being lazy. So what if we just design everything as possible with a rear side, and then whatever we can't, we'll just bridge manually, and then that would be a double-sided circuit board if we did it for real. Because like in modern times, there's not a huge difference in having like a single-sided or double-sided circuit board. I mean, in the past, you know, well, 
also with, well, there is a difference. I mean, any, any device that can do single-sided does a single-sided, but maybe it's not such a big deal for us. For the hex game, we're going to use a piezo instead of a speaker. And we have these two piezos here to choose from. They're both surface mount. The difference between these, aside from the package that they're in, is that this one uh, has its own continuous tone, whereas this one needs to be sent a pulse. I'll, I'll demonstrate for you what that means. This piezo that has its own continuous pulse, I've got the four volts here that I'll put on it. It's, um, it has a polarity, so this is going to, it's going to be the ground side here. And this is where the positive voltage will connect and we get a continuous tone, right? We just have a four volts DC going into it, whereas this other one, it requires a pulse. And now when I connect the, uh, the four volts to it, we get nothing. It doesn't matter what lead, how I orientate the leads, we still get nothing. However, on the uh, uh, function generator here, I have a square wave set up. Here is zero volts, and then I have it set, let's see here, amplitude for five volts. A square wave is gonna come up, and then we'll come over. We'll go back up and there will be another pulse. So this is our square wave. Another way we could do this, we could go from 0 to 2.5 and then 0 to negative 2.5. This is another version of the square wave. And then we have, again, 0 in the middle. Our signal comes up, goes up to 2.5, and then goes down to 2.5, and then back up to 0. <laughs> this gives us 5 volts peak to peak, which I looked up the data sheet. This is uh, this piezo. That's what this piezo is rated for. On the uh, function generator, I have it set so that we will go from zero to five volts. Okay, I'll turn the output on. From the pulse goes up, over, down, over again, and then back up. This is our period. And I have it set for one kilohertz. So within this pulse, we have our duty cycle. And our duty cycle is the length that this pulse is high. Right now, we have it set for 50% duty cycle. One might also say it's the ratio between high and low. So we'll turn on the output again. We'll hear this. We'll hear the signal from the piezo. And I'm going to go ahead and change the duty cycle so we can hear how it uh, affects the piezo. So we're going up to 60% duty cycle, 80% duty cycle, and then back down to 50, and then down to 20. And we can also adjust the frequency. So we will more than likely use a non-continuous piezo in our electronics hex game. Okay, so I started laying out some of these components and my first thought was to just use the A through G labeling of the segments and match it up to the shift registers, just so it makes sense on a schematic. But then I realized that might not be the best thing for a single layer board. So what I should do is actually map them out, not necessarily in the order of matching A through G, which doesn't really matter because we can make whatever patterns we want in the program, but rather map them out in such a way that it makes the shortest and easiest traces that will work with a single sided board. So yeah, I'm gonna have to do that, I think. Uh, one thing I can do to kind of give me a hint though is I can tie all of the uh, segment buses together because remember one shift register is going to drive the segment and the other one is going to drive the uh, source current, which means on the segments at least A through G are going to be on a bus all tied together. Uh, yeah, and then we just have to interface that bus into the first shift register. Uh, so this is part's going to take a little bit of thought actually. Making simple looking boards actually is more work than making overly complex boards. Like Steve Jobs once said, difficult is easy, simple is hard. All right, well, I laid out some stuff here for the LED portion. I kind of made a bus and then used as few vias as possible to complete it. Double-sided board isn't really that big of a deal. However, if Felix and I want to make a laser paint prototype with laser, 
uh, it would be nice to keep it as single-sided as possible. So I kind of ran into an issue with the input shift registers that have to hook up to these eight switches here. And my problem was kind of how to position it, especially since this is a TSOP 16, kind of a small package. But then I realized I could do is kind of a hack. I could go in and uh, put the bytes halfway across these shift registers. I mean, like when this shifts in, it's gonna become a 16-bit value no matter what. So we could just look at the middle eight bits instead of the first eight or the second eight. And then we could just use the uh, LSBs or MSBs as the other general purpose buttons, you know, like mode select, start, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, so by doing this, it kind of splits up how the wiring goes to each shift register. And I think that'll give us a better shot of wiring it directly. So here's a shift register here, and I still have it just, it's uh, just the rat nest. But see, if I rotate it like that, see how we have a straight shot with these lines? And that's good. And over here, we have the same thing. It's like in this orientation, it's kind of crisscross, make you jump, jump. But in this one, it's more straightforward. I mean, we're still gonna have to deal with the uh, clock signals and everything, but by splitting it across two shift registers, it gives us a little bit more breathing room. And we need two shift registers anyway, so yeah. We'll just have to do a bit shift of four to the right when we do the compare value, not a big deal. I mean, we have like what, 16 extra bytes of program memory? I'm just gonna go to town. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna find the best place for these uh, shift registers. Then once I know where they will go, then I can figure out where to put the AT Tiny itself and the other uh, driving shift register along with its uh, PMP transistors that will drive each column of the LED. I've got the drawing a good ways here, but it just feels wrong to me. Uh, trying to do it single-sided means that I did a bunch of things kind of badly. And I'm kind of thinking maybe what I should do is rip up a lot of this, you know, like remove the lines and uh, kind of start over. Not completely. I mean, I'd leave everything where it is, but I don't know. Just some of it's like this stuff over here, like <laughs> with the with the switches. We've got the grounds and the signals going around. And I mean, it technically worked, but it just seems kind of sloppy. Then I got some wackiness going on over here. Yeah, a little iffy. Well, I'll save this, I'll make a copy of it, and then I'll alter the copy, and then if I feel better about what, I've, what I'm have what i doing with the copy, then maybe I'll just go with that. But, I don't know, I mean, I was trying to make something that I could do single-sided so we could laser paint it here. Uh, maybe that's just too limiting. We'll see what I come up with. Okay, I finished up this design at home last night, and I think it's pretty decent. Making it single-sided would have been pretty much impossible because actually a, gonna be a pretty small board. However, I do recall that we were able to do double-sided laser paint back in the day. So I think if we make a nice jig and use the CNC machine to make some nice square symmetrical PCB chunks, we should probably have a pretty good shot of making it work. I mean, it's not like it's that complicated of a board. Okay, so there were some digits that weren't soldered correctly and also some of my character defines were messed up. The combination of which made the characters look really bad, but I think we're uh, getting in a good place here. So I have it forced to hex mode right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right, I also shifted the digits over. So we're not doing anything here, but it basically, you know, those are like the original three digits. So it's drawing a space, but it's not drawing anything here. So I thought we could probably use this one for like a timer. Like we could have this counting down. Although in decimal mode, that wouldn't look as good because you'd have, you know, three characters here. Uh, yeah, so okay, so all the digits are working, all the switches are working, the shift registers are working. So now I just have to reprogram it to use these touch buttons to change mode instead of the toggle switches. Uh, yeah, but uh, all in all, um, the basic concept works. So what I think I'll do is 
probably before even bother reprogramming it, I'll refine my eagle drawing and make something that I can send off to get a board made, probably from Osh Park and get it a couple weeks. Well, that's all we have for today, but I think this turned out really well. We took our hand-soldered prototype of the Hex game and turned it into an in-house built laser paint prototype. Yeah, this was our best board that we made yet. I think this would make a great educational tool. What do you think about it? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll at ya next time. Too dumb? Pretty silly. Yeah. Felix, let me play the game. <laughs> <Lee Wimp. laughs> Felix, I really want to play that game and you no, have to give me that game right no, now. No, you already played. All morning. It'll be too hot to handle, too cold to cook. The couple goes buses in the head control. Had him throwing a party for a bunch of children, but all the while slime was under the building. Okay, I guess my point is, you know, when Iago, not, not, who's the monkey? Jafu, Abu? When the monkey turns out to be like the CGI nonsense, it's like everyone knows what a, a real monkey looks like. We made a PCB breadboard prototype of the Hex Logic game. Then we made a laser paint version of it. Then we refined that design in Eagle and then sent off for some boards from Osh Park. In today's episode, I'm going to solder up the first one and make sure that it works since I designed it. I think it'd be cool if Felix coached you and Max on how to solder up the other two. Felix was talking about how this could be a good kit for schools. Mm -hmm. So if you guys can do it, students could do it. You two are going to be soldering. Woo! So we're gonna be your test subjects, huh? Yep.